Welcome to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Here's your host, Grant Bledsoe. Hello, everybody. Grant Bledsoe here. Welcome back to Grow Money Business. This week on the podcast, my guest is Dominic Rubino. Dominic has a very interesting background as an entrepreneur. He got a degree in archaeology before starting a pharmacy company, growing it to over nine figures in revenue before selling it, buying into a franchise business, growing it to over 200 franchise locations, selling that. And now he works as a business coach to business owners in the construction industry. So he has a very interesting background. He's been in multiple industries, and now he delivers coaching services and helps people in the construction industry focus on mindset and profit growth. We had a great conversation in this episode. Dominic was a treat to speak with, and one of his big focuses in his coaching career now is on mindset. So a little forewarning, this episode gets a little bit on the philosophical end about how to align what you're doing in your business with your personal life and how to build the life you want through what you're doing in your business, which is keenly interesting to me, not quite as technical as a lot of the financial planning stuff we often talk about on the podcast. But nonetheless, Dominic's background was really interesting. I got a kick out of talking to him. He has a great story and helps a lot of people in the construction industry. Hey, everybody. Real quick before we jump into today's episode, I have been advised by my attorneys to remind you all that none of what you might hear in today or any other episode of Grow Money Business is financial, investing, tax, legal, fitness, or even relationship advice. It's content that you're free to use and deploy on your own terms. And before you take any actions on what we might cover in the show, I really encourage you to consult with your accountant, attorney, or financial planner. If you don't have a financial planner and think that you might need one, be sure to check out threeoakswealth.com to learn more about my firm's planning, advice, and investment services. Welcome, Dominic. Thank you for joining me today. Yeah, nice to see you, Grant. So today we've got Dominic Rubino on the podcast, and Dominic has a very interesting and varied Mm -hmm. background in entrepreneurship. And Dominic, I won't attempt to tell your story for you. And I want to hear about your background. You've got, you've done a lot of interesting things in the past. I love having entrepreneurial success stories on the show, but now you focus on coaching and mindset, which is something I want to dive into as well. So would you be able to share a little bit about your, about your background and and maybe what you do right now and how you got there along the way? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a big question. And, you know, unfortunately, when you hand me the microphone at some point, you've got to steal it back. (laughs) But I'm okay it, with that. <laughs> you know, when it when it comes to mindset, mindset is everything for business owners and entrepreneurs. And really, you know, it's the same thing I'm sure you see for wealth management. If I feel like all I have is a dollar and I'm scared about that dollar, then I start to have a scarcity mentality. But if I, instead I look at that one dollar and I say, wow, imagine what I could do with this dollar. It's just a different mindset. And that mindset is the difference that all of us have. Uh, I don't know where I got this from. You know, I grew up at a kitchen table, like I think a lot of people, both my parents worked, very focused on get a job, be a great employee and do all those things. But I had this entrepreneurial side to me. And so in high school, I started my first company and I installed Christmas lights on people's houses. How timely is that? Not bad. Can you come over to my house? Like we could yeah. probably use some help. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that anyway. I mean, listen, talk about a bad business plan. I had my dad's ladder and a staple gun. And now I was in the Pacific Northwest, so I was stapling Christmas lights to cedar shake roofs with my dad's ladder, just waiting to die, basically. That was, my, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I'll rem- I remember my cousins and I have, I'm Italian. I have lots of cousins. I'm not short on cousins, but they were laughing at me. Oh, you started your own business. What are you doing? I'm like, I'm in, st-, you know, the company was called the Yo Ho Ho Light Co. Because I, I like to have fun. Yeah. And uh, I saw everybody at Christmas. They're like, how much money did you make in your company? And I said, I did the math. And I think I made 23 bucks this year. <laughs> like after <laughs> expenses and everything. But it's who I think looking back now, it's who I became in trying to start a business. In running a company that got me to where I am today. Which is now I've I've built and sold a couple of uh, really great companies that's, you know, I've left behind some really great legacies and great people in, in place in those businesses. And it all started by just trying and just marching forward. 
Well, good, good for you. I, I, I would like to to focus for a minute or two on on what what you shared there at the very beginning about how to view a dollar and the scarcity mm-hmm. mindset versus the the potential for other things that you could do. Yeah. And, and 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 one of my observations in my own career and, and working with a lot of business owners in the planning practice is that he, he, when you're a W two employee, yeah, the the boundaries of best case versus worst case scenario can be wide depending on your job and the structure and all that. Yeah. But when you're calling the shots in a business, the trajectory and the, and those boundaries instantly get way, way wider. And, yeah. and the direction and the path that you take either upward toward success, whatever that means to you, or, or downward toward, you know, closer to failure, whatever that means to you, it's all subjective yeah. is really, really dependent on how you view the world, the lens through which you view the world and your mindset. So could yeah. you talk a, a little bit about how you think about that concept at this point? Yeah, you know, it comes, it, it really comes down to everybody sees the world in a different way. I'm just saying that the way that I see it has worked for me and many other people around me. But when you look at people who are successful, they have something called, I don't want to get too technical. It's called an internal locus of control. Now, there's a great book on it that, that boomerangs off that concept. It's called the Oz Principle. You ever heard of the Oz Principle? No. Oh, okay. So it what it talks about is that at all times in our life, we have a choice. And that choice represents a line. So if right in front of you, you draw a line across your chest, there's a line. You can either be above the line or you can be below the line. It's my choice to be above the line or below the line at any given time. Now, I'll set the joke up in, the, in advance. If you're ever driving with me in traffic, you will find me to be a below the line driver. And you'll understand why that's funny in a second. People <laughs> who are above the line make a choice to, to be a winner. People below the line, you know what the opposite of winner is, right? Uh, <clears throat> trying to avoid the word loser, but I yeah, can't. <laughs> but we can't. So what I do as a business coach, because I have to be you know politically sensitive, is the opposite is whiner. But look at what we've already done. We've already identified, we don't even know what that line is and what it does, what the definition is above, about above and below the line, but we know that there's a winner above the line and a whiner below the line. So people above the line, I'll tell you what they look like. They look like people who take responsibility, who are accountable for their actions. They take ownership for what they do and they have an abundance mentality. They see opportunity. People below the line are exactly the opposite. They place blame, they make excuses, They're negative, they're in denial, and all they see is scarcity. And Grant, your face just changed, and you're thinking about one of the meals you're having over Christmas and New Year's and who's going to be sitting at your table that you had to invite over. (laughs) We won't name names, (laughs) mother-in-laws. But that's above and below the line. I didn't say anything. (laughs) I didn't say anything either. I don't even know who your mother-in-law is. I'm making that joke for everybody. But And by the way, I have to choose who I hang out with. If I hang out with people like you who are above the, I know, I already know you're above the line because of what you do and how you present yourself. You're probably the kind of person who takes accountability and responsibility. If you place blame and you make excuses and you're negative and you're in denial, that's a person who goes through life seeing less and less opportunity. A person above the line sees opportunity more and more. They see chances more and more. It doesn't mean that you're uh, go through the life as a cheerleader, but you see the opportunities and then you can make the choice to take them or not. That's that's very well put, and and I should probably pause here for a moment. You know, this is a podcast where we talk about a lot of technical financial planning stuff. I talk about tax, I talk about investing, and then we talk about business stuff and entrepreneurship. And and our episode today is maybe a little bit off the beaten path of what we typically talk about on the podcast. And um, I just want to mention to everybody listening: this stuff is vitally important. How how you view the world, and and, and I think it's, I've worked with a number of coaches in the past in my business. Some have been great. Some have been not so great. I I think one of the criticisms that uh, business owners sometimes have about working with a coach is, you know, I don't need some, and you use the word cheerleader, but but it it seems like, uh, you know, some raw, raw person just pushing me to go do stuff that's uncomfortable that I don't want to do. Um, there's that there, there's a little bit of that sense and dynamic in the, in this community sometimes. And my, my perspective on that is because growth in business in life. And I know this is uh, on the philosophical side of things again, requires being uncomfortable to make 
improvements and breakthroughs. And um, I'd like to get your thoughts on that in, in just a minute. But one, one quote on this that I thought was very, I'm, I'm probably going to uh, butcher it, but one quote I heard recently that I think is very apropos is we need to take um, responsibility. No, I need to think about it. I can't remember what it is. Ah, I'm going to okay. kick myself later for this. Okay. Can, can you can you just what what is your perspective on that dynamic of rah rah cheerleader versus pushing somebody through uh, uncomfortable barriers that they don't necessarily want to go through for the purpose of yeah. reaching success? So I'll t- I'll tell you what it and I think you're absolutely right. It is hard to find a good business coach, and not everybody needs a business coach. Let's start there. And I'm not expecting anybody to call me after this because I that's not the thing here. But you have to find somebody that aligns with you and what you need at the right time in your life. The reason it's hard to find a good business coach is because the only person that says you can or can't be a business coach in this world is the kid behind the counter at Staples who prints your business cards. There's no governing body that says this is a good business coach and this isn't. So you've got to do your due diligence. You gotta, if you want more business focused stuff, get a business focused business coach. I happen to have built and so I, I think I told you just before we started. I'm not great, but I've built two businesses that are multi-million dollar that I've sold. And I started both of those from scratch. I also made some massive mistakes. One of my side gigs when I was still in corporate was I started selling used junk on eBay. I was so new to selling on eBay that when the president's list came out for stocks, I threw the letter away. I was invited to the president's list for the initial stock offering for eBay. And I thought, eBay, where's this going? And I remember draining that in the basket. With the, I just crumpled up the letter. I'm like, where is this thing going? So have I taken my own advice? No, I have failed so many times. I've passed up opportunities. But you know what? I've also had the opportunity or the freedom to make decisions because I've been a business owner, because I've taken that. So everybody's got choice in front of them. And it's only when we put ourselves in the position where we've got a lot of choice that we can make good decisions. When we limit ourselves through whatever it is, so that we don't have a lot of choice, we're forced to make a bad decision. That's that's well put. And how, how do you? This is all through the context, all with the framework of success looks a little bit different to everybody. For everybody, yeah. At, and often at different points in the same person's life, success is going to be different in year one than it is in year five or year ten. Is it ever? Yeah. How, how do you? How do you? If you're struggling defining what success means to you, what you're really shooting toward, what suggestions do you have for people to try to iron out what that actually looks like to plan strategically toward it? Yeah, that's a tough one. It's actually, it's a great question. And you'd think I'm the guy who would answer that right away. But here, here's the exercise that I think you could do is if that question that, that you just asked, Grant, is important to somebody, like, how do I know what's important to me? Leave the office, go get a coffee at a nice coffee shop, take a blank notebook and a pen. And go face the corner at that coffee shop. Turn off your cell phone and start writing. And okay, if you like working on your computer and you like typing on your keypad, do that too. But I I don't care. But what I want you to do is write down, just start writing down what's important to me, what's not important to me, right? There's something that we talk about called diamond mapping. So if everybody can listen along for a second, I want you to draw a big plus sign on the page. So it ups, you know, like a, a line up and down and a line across it. So a big plus sign. At the top, just draw the words financial independence. At the bottom, draw career opportunity. On the left, write family and relationships. And on the right, write out your, uh, did I already say financial independence? Financial independence, family and finance. Oh, now I've blown it just like you. We're even. (laughs) Hey, we're even. Bunch of geniuses here. (laughs) So you got family, business, relationship. (laughs) Oh, and uh, uh, your personal life. Like whatever you consider to be health. It could be family, faith, fitness, whatever those things are. So now you've got a plus sign, a huge plus sign on your page. So go and do two things. First of all, mark where you are today on each of those lines. And then as you sip your coffee, facing the wall. And the reason I want you facing the wall is I don't want distractions. I don't want your friend to walk by and enter into a conversation. This is work time. We're not doing that now. So first draw where you are today and then take your pen and mark where you want to be. The distance between those two things is where your goals comes in. Now all you got to do is go fill them in. Go do those things. I've reinvented my businesses just doing that simple exercise. That's that's, that's well put. And and I, I think chronologically, personally. And one thing that uh, and a similar exercise coaches have put me through in the past is 
you know, it takes stock of all those items and it can be in a 3D, you know, plus sign like you described. Yeah. Where are you at today? What is what does it look like in a perfect world for you 10 yeah. years out, five years out? And then That's you just it. do the math of closing those gaps. What do you need to do on a year to year basis to get from here to there in each of these areas? And I, I think so often in the business owner community, we're, we're really focused on driving bottom line revenue and profit growth, income growth. And we don't quite take stock as much as we should of work-life balance and family, family relationships and all the intangible stuff that's really, what, mat what, really yeah. what matters in life, right? Yeah. And, and uh, it's an exercise with your team in your business as much as it is a personal exercise. Yeah. You said something earlier that, that actually it, it's so true. And you just define me is my financial goals have changed over time. Now, the only thing that I think about, and that's code for it consumes me is making sure my family's taken care of when I, uh, you know, rainbow highway. How do, how do we say that politely? Right. Um, Auger in is one of my, well, the way one Auger of my clients, in. like, yeah, <laughs> Auger in is one of my clients likes to say. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, anyways, when I'm no longer around, um, <laughs> But I, I'm really concerned about that. And so I start to think about legacy. I start to think about recurring revenue opportunities in my investments. I start to think harder about how the decisions I make today first are going to be viewed by my kids as wise decisions because I want them to learn those wise decisions from me. But I also want to have those things in place so that my wife is taken care of. If uh, something happens to me, my kids are definitely taken care of. It's my I feel more than ever, it's my job to do that. And so now I'm looking at real estate investment trusts. I'm looking at different financial tools and vehicles that I know will be there to sustain them after I go. Because my job right now is my job. But if I'm not doing that job, there's no money coming in. And it's my job. You know, I get to be a dad. I get to be married to my awesome wife. Those are privileges. So now I've got to do some things to make sure they're taken care of. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's well put. I, I think I found the phrase I was looking for earlier and, and along this process of where are we right now? Yeah. Where do we want to go both personally and professionally? And what does that gap look like? As we reflect on that, we have to really try to understand how we're being complicit in leading the life that we really want to change. That's the yeah. word I was looking for is, is how are we, how are we being complicit in staying in, in, you know, you can call it a groove in, in the yeah. rut. If things are going great, then you probably, you know, you're in, you're in the groove. You don't want to change things, yeah. but everybody has something that they're striving to improve, whether that be financially, business wise, personally, and going through a, 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 an annual formalized planning process like this is just really, really beneficial. Can I, can I add something that's awkward and maybe yeah. going to offend some people? <laughs> it's my job as a business okay. coach. I'm not, okay. I'm not, a, I'm a very happy and positive guy, but I have to drop the truth bombs when they need to be dropped. Somebody out there is going to hate hearing this and somebody else is going to understand the impact, but we may have to change our friends because you and I are more like the five or six people we hang out with the most. Those are the influences in our life. And so if your best friend is somebody who is a negative kind of person, who's down all the time, who's you know, builds up drama unnecessarily, who's just really thinks about drinking more than fitness, then that might not be the right person for you to hang out with, right? So you might need to change your friend group. And I, I have no invested interest in anybody listening, and I'm not trying to offend anybody. But that's a real consideration. You have to break free of that shackle to change the legacy of your last name. It has to start today. Yeah, back back to your your point of abundance or scarcity and being above board. You, what we're trying to do is put ourselves in an, an environment where positive thoughts and experiences are coming in, helping support us to remain above board, right. yeah. and not surrounding ourselves with negativity that's constantly pulling us south of the border. Yeah, yeah. We have, you know, if you if you're the kind of person who sees opportunity, but your friend group always makes fun of you, you know guys are guys. We're going to mock each other no matter what. The worse, better for me. <laughs> but but if they truly are going to say, oh, that's never going to work. That's a dumb idea. Uh, you, you just might want to go have beers with somebody else or coffee with somebody else or go running with somebody else. You know, but there's an example. If you want to start running marathons, you're just naturally going to start hanging out with marathon runners. If you want to climb mountains, you start hanging out with mountain climbing people. If you want to build your own financial wealth, if you want to invest in real estate, if you want to understand more about stocks and bonds and those kind of financial tools, I would imagine listening to your show is a step towards that because now you're a guy I hang out with. I start to just 
understand that world a bit, learn the language, see the different perspectives. That's what I need to do more of. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's well put. So let's, we, we've, we've, uh, fallen on the philosophical side so far in the episode, which, which, which is great. You know, this is not something that we've covered a whole lot of, in a whole lot of detail, um, uh, on the show in the past. I hope we haven't lost everybody yet, but, uh, let's bring this into a more formalized strategic planning framework. Mm -hmm. So if you're running a business, you know, I, I get it. I want to keep my, my thoughts and everything above the line. Here's where I'm at. There are some things that I want to change my perfect life. My perfect business 10 years out looks a little bit different than it is today based yeah. on my personal definition of success. And I understand where the goalposts are. How do we work that into an annual strategic planning process? Is that even the right process to, to take? It is. Yeah. And is this episode going to be going live pretty timely? Like, does everybody know it's December right now? Uh, everybody probably knows it's like late January right now. <laughs> we're, we're recording this in, in mid-December right before the holidays. Oh, perfect. Yeah. I mean, I, I record, you know, I have podcasts as well and I record six weeks in advance or yeah. in arrears, right? So That's I, probably I'm about saying, what we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, the timeliness doesn't matter except that it's around the beginning of the year, which for mm -hmm. some reason makes us all feel like hitting reset. That yeah. and the end of summer. Those are the two times and the end of summer makes no sense, but it's a reset time, right? Yep. But yes, strategic planning works. Now, there are two books that if, or systems or processes that I use to show business owners how to reset themselves. You can choose between either one of them. They both do the same thing. Um, but those systems, especially for business owners, help you establish that cadence, that rhythm of success. And one book is called Traction. It's written by Gino Wickman. You might know it by the name EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating System. That one's really, really good and solid. The grandfather of that book and the one I learned, not, it feels like 100 years ago, was written by Vern Harnish. It was originally called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Are you familiar with that? We've talked about these a lot on the on the podcast, traction and traction. mastering yeah. the uh, uh, Rockefeller habits. It's but the the newer up. version is scaling up. Yeah, scaling both up. by Vern yeah. Harnish. That's right. Vern is amazing. These these are the two or three um, Bibles of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I would say. Would Would yeah. you concur I, with that? I would absolutely agree. Now, Vern Harnish is a man who's left a legacy in this world because he started EO, which is the Entrepreneurs Organization. I've been a member of EO now twice with two different qualifying businesses, and it's it's just the most impactful thing I've ever been in. And some of your listeners would be members of EO. And so we're, they're giving me a virtual thumbs up right now. But listen, that is the strategic planning framework that a really solid, wise, and contemplative business owner takes. This is not a time for drama. This is a time to, to sit down and say, look, what's our 10-year plan? That's kind of fuzzy, to be honest. 10 years is a hard plan. But let's start thinking about 10 years. And then let's start from there, squeeze it a little bit and say, what would that look like in three years? Do some work. Again, in the coffee shop, face in the corner, just you and your book and a hot cup of coffee. And then after you've looked at your three-year plan, say, what would a one-year plan look like? And then after you squeeze that one-year plan, out pops a quarterly plan. What do I need to do in the next three months? That's easy. That is dead simple. Get this kind of client, lose that kind of client, change our system for this. That's all you've got to do in that next three months. If all you do is that three months worth of work, you'll have beat everybody else in your industry by an entire year. But when you keep doing that quarter after quarter, week after week, your business just changes infinitesimally. Yeah, I, I like the word you use there too. Infinitesimal is, is, is the wrong word, by the way. That means too small. Your business, cha <laughs> <laughs> your business changes a lot. In, in, infinitely, maybe. The... Infinitely, there you go, infinitely. I like, I like the word you use there, rhythm. Because when I when I started this business, mm. it's real hard the first couple of years. You know, you have kind of an idea of what you want to do, but I didn't really have any um, concept of what I needed to do every quarter to stay on track and revise that long term vision. Mm. And and the ten year vision is is really really challenging to come up with. Ten years is a long time, as you put it. But on a quarter to quarter basis, that ten year vision is probably not going to deviate a whole lot. Year yeah. to year, it might right. But the stuff that you need when you when you reverse engineer it and work it down into the stuff that you really need to accomplish and in traction, they call these your rocks. This is the stuff that I have to do this quarter. That's going to change dramatically, but it's very uh, changed quarter to quarter quite a bit, but it's very, very logical. And yeah. if you're looking from it from the standpoint of, you know, 10 years out, this is what I think I want. Oh, today, you know, I'll do this tomorrow. I'll focus on that. 
when when you apply a framework like this, it is very easy to say, this is the one thing I've got to do this quarter. This is my sole focus. And I am far more uh, effective over the course of a couple of years. Let me ask. Which is why they call it traction, right? Yeah, because you want to get traction. For people listening right now who are saying, how am I going to build a 10-year plan? Well, I want you to take yourself to that nice coffee shop with a hot cup of coffee, you with a notebook sitting there facing the wall. And the exercise I want you to do to help you figure out your 10-year plan is on a column, write down your name, your spouse's name, your kids' names. And then how old are they today? How old will they be in three years? How old will they be in 10 years? And when you start to think your 11-year-old daughter will be 21 in 10 years, oh boy, you start to think about what 10 years looks like. It becomes a lot easier to say, here's what I need to do in three years. Here's what I need to do in a year. Now your 11-year-old daughter will be 12. You can see that, right? I can't see her at 21, but I can see her at 12. And what do I need to do this quarter? And so that's just a, a really great exercise to get your head in the mindset of how do I see the future when it's so fuzzy? We'll start to do the things around you that are really impactful, that mean something to you. That's, that's really well put. Yeah, you, you, you sync it up with something personal that's yeah. you're really trying to work toward. Um, let's talk about your, your personal background and what these builds and sales of your prior businesses really looked like. So you, mm. you've, you've built and sold two different businesses. What were they? How did they go? Take us through some of the details. Sure. Well, I've had a couple of failures in there too, but uh, thankfully we skipped those really quickly. <laughs> so <laughs> I started in corporate, you know, I did just as a, just, if you like the funny stuff, my, I went to university, I have an arts degree and that arts degree is in archeology. span So I'm supposed to be a forensic anthropologist, but that, that didn't take because I started that Christmas light business and then I started a house painting business and then I did some minor renovations and that was going okay, but I wasn't getting what I wanted. And I was playing at being a business owner and I thought I'd better go and, and work in corporate for a while. So I went and worked for Sprint and I sold, <laughs> this is a laugh too. You'll know how old I am. I sold long distance services. Oh, nice. I would, I'd try to find offices, maybe like yours that had like a national clientele that you were on the phone all the time working mm -hmm. with people all over and you had big long distance bills. Anyways, I hated it. And so I started what's today called a side gig. And that side gig was selling used junk on eBay. And so I sold used calculators, used Dungeons and Dragons games, used Atari and ColecoVision games, Beanie Babies, whatever I could get my hands on. And I would sell them on eBay. Well, that started to do really well. And I thought I need a, a more consistent supply. So I, start, I changed it into selling books. There's some funny stories in there too, but I don't want to take the whole podcast with it. From books, I changed to selling mail order medications. And from there, I turned into a full-fledged pharmacy. And so I started CanadaPharmacy.com. And uh, when I sold that business, we had $120 million in sales. I had a, a, an operating pharmacy of 40 pharmacists and technicians, basically a production line. And then we had a call center as well that was about 120 people. So it was about 160 staff company that I built from really an Excel spreadsheet. I sold that company. And the, and the reason I sold it will be very familiar to people who have a business right now with family involved. Oh my God, that is a different beast. Family businesses are a delicate dance. And uh, we had all the things that you would imagine in a family business. We had business meetings at our board ta boardroom table where we would say to each other, okay, we can't talk about this outside the room because it's sensitive and people are going to be offended. And by the time I drove home, in my truck, my mom was phoning me, asking me what happened in that meeting. <laughs> she heard it through my cousin who told his mom, who called my mom, who was now offended. And oh my God, just a complete disaster. And, <laughs> and more, more illustrious stories than that. But anyways, I sold that business and I, I did well. As you'd imagine, a $120 million business sets you up pretty well for quite a long time. But I, I wanted to do something else. And so I had you know, Grant, a lot of my stories overlap because I, I tend to do a couple things at once. So I had become a business coach when I left corporate and as I started selling used junk on eBay. And so that kind of slid over into my mail order pharmacy days. And so I kept doing the coaching after I sold the pharmacy because I love business. I'm supposed to be a business coach. I'm not a theory business coach. I'm a, like a, I'm a reality guy. You mm -hmm. can probably tell. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so uh, Brian Tracy, who's a really well-known name and, you know, admittedly more 80s and 90s well-known name, but he's a really well-known name in the world of business improvement and sales improvement. And so he had built a brand as a, as a business coaching brand 
uh, under the name Focal Point. And so I bought Focal Point, the global rights from Focal Point for, from Brian Tracy. And he had six franchisees at the time. And then uh, it took me 13 years and I built it up to 237 franchise units all around the world. We had franchisees wow. in Australia, in Brazil, obviously America, uh, Canada, and some other places. It was just fantastic. And then I sold that business. And, you know, when you talk about the, the why, what drives you, I remember we got a phone call from four of our franchisees. They wanted a conference call with us. And when you're a franchisor and four franchisees get together and want a conference call with the owners, you kind of poop your pants a little bit. It's not it's usually not good news. It's not good. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we're around the, the Tritel phone at the, the boardroom table and, and uh, they wanted to buy us or they wanted to buy in and be partners. And so my partner and I said, well, thank you. It's very nice, but we're not ready to sell. Appreciate the offer. So I went home that night to my wife and I said, you won't believe what happened today. Some of our franchisees asked to buy into the company. And she's like, oh, what great news. And you're doing all the great things. And, and, and in the same sentence, I said, look, we're not going to sell because we're not ready to sell. But next week, honey, I'm, I'm going to leave Monday and I'll be back Thursday. Normal pattern of travel for me. And the way we sit at the dinner table, my wife sits kind of on my right side and my son sits next to her. And he didn't say anything, but I could just see him out of the corner of my eye. And inside his skin, he shrunk a size. Mm. And I just thought, what the heck am I doing? Like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? I actually missed his first steps. I missed his first talking because I was on the road. I was an on the road entrepreneur. And I thought to myself, you know what? I don't, this isn't me. I don't want to do this anymore. My heart was gone. And I'm, like I said, I get to be a dad. It's not, I am your dad. I get to be my kid's dad and, and my husband, my wife's husband. And so I went in the next day to my business partner and started a very difficult conversation, <laughs> very difficult. And I sold the company. I sold it. I got out. And then I, that's why I started the two podcasts and I serve a community that I absolutely love, which is construction business owners, contractors. Uh, yeah, that's my, that's kind of my entrepreneurial background flavor one. There's a bunch of different. Yeah. 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 So you, you were running into th th this concept of preserving family relationships when everybody's involved in the family business is just a. I think the technical term is hot mess. It's really, <laughs> that was a nice really way to tough. Say it. Yeah, it's yeah. really tough, right? Yeah. So you you uh, wind wound up selling that business with all the family stuff going on. Were you able to get out and preserve all the family relationships? What was the dynamic like after that ended? Yeah. So the dynamic it was tough in the beginning. Uh, that cousin has gone on to do fantastic things. Like he didn't suffer from me leaving, and I didn't suffer from me leaving either. Uh, the, the family relationships that didn't survive because there was a number of different family members, I'm not even worried about. We're so diametrically opposed in how we see the world. Doesn't even affect me anymore. I've, I've grown. They haven't. So I'm just going to keep doing my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I love my family and I would still go to bat for any of them. It's just that we're not going to we're not going to do business together. and We're not going to hang out. Yeah. 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 So after having gone through a couple of these transactions, you sold the pharmacy business. You sold the franchising business. Do you have any, it, it sounds like the, the drivers uh, for you for both of those transactions were purely personal, where you're at in your own life, where you're at in your family life and what you wanted the next steps to look like. Yeah. Do you have anything that you would have done differently looking back on it now before, or maybe specific details of either of those transactions? I would have sold both of them sooner. Would have sold both of them sooner, really? Yeah. Yeah, because in both of them, I waited too long to sell. Not for financial reasons, but because it wasn't accommodating the lifestyle you wanted. It, yeah, it wasn't It wasn't the lifestyle. And so the one thing I came to learn, and I don't know when I learned this, is that I can go create another company. A lot of people can't. And I know that might sound arrogant, but I can go do it again. Yeah. And, and just a lot of people can't. But it's took, it took a lot of practice and a lot of failure and a very patient wife. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's, it's something I can do, uh, you know, and, and I don't like to create something from scratch. I take systems that already work and then I put them to work and then I try to make them better. And I try to put systems together that weren't supposed to be together. And I try to recreate things. And, uh, and that's great. You don't have to do that. You can start a lawn mowing business and just be really, really good at servicing your clients and be just as successful as you want to be. It doesn't have to be technical. It doesn't have to be sexy internet business. Look at the crumbs under the elephant. There's a lot of crumbs under an elephant. And go look for those businesses that are overlooked and maybe not 
sexy or attractive, but are huge profit margin. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 well put. There is a huge right now back on the financial planning side of things. Yeah. Interest rates are super low. We're awash in all this easy money flooding the system. My Investors goodness. from around the world are just looking for opportunities and looking for yield. So the valuations on public securities are really, really high. That's flowing through private equity. All these private equity funds are just awash in cash looking for stuff to uh, smaller companies to buy. But for the stuff that most people listening to this show, my, myself, certainly, you're, you're maybe in a, a different stratosphere than the rest of us, but the, the, the size of businesses that we would be looking to buy and get into are really below the, the, the purview of any private equity fund looking to pick up those scraps. And so the crumbs underneath the elephant, is, as, as you put it, which is a great analogy, there are just tons of opportunities to buy into an existing business, turn it around with your personal expertise and background, and then uh, continue running it or selling it or, or do whatever accommodates your lifestyle. It, it's, a, it's a fun existence to do stuff like that. Yeah. And I'm seeing lots of those transactions. I've had people on my show, Carl Mitchell, uh, Michael Kaplan, that have all built these, what we, you know, the banks call them small businesses and they're under 20 million. And mm -hmm. I'm like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Do you know what it takes to build a business that's a million dollars? And we talk about it like it's nothing, but somebody's entire soul got put into making a business that generated $83,333 a month. That's a big deal. And banks call it, you know, you're a small business. Yeah. What? Yeah. And there, anyways, there's tons of opportunities there. I'm in the process right now of, of, I don't sell businesses, but I help companies that I work with get ready to be sold or to be buyable is actually a better way to say it. Because you can't sell your business unless it's buyable. But those opportunities exist and the the returns on a well operated small business are crazy. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the potential, but back to what we were talking about earlier, the boundaries, best case scenario and worst case scenario are a heck of a lot wider than any other yeah. career path. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Dominic. You, you if you had done anything differently, you would have sold both of these businesses sooner. Right. You you worked as a coach kind of throughout while doing all of this. If you, yeah. what would you tell yourself throughout if you were being your own coach? Uh, I know I'm on your show and this doesn't mean, sound self-serving and I'm not trying to give you, I would have invested better earlier. So I literally go to bed at night wishing I'd bought more houses in the nineties. Hmm. Uh, because where I live now, uh, a house that would have sold as an example or an investment package, you know, like let's say, but just say a house, three bedroom, two bath that would have sold for anywhere between 130 to 300,000 is now minimum a million dollars where I live, a million to $4 million. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an easy way for me to have made massive uh, you know, gains on my asset base. Uh, but the other thing I didn't do is I didn't invest enough in compound interest tools because the amount of, I tried to have this conversation with my son the other day, and I think he actually made the snoring sound, but the, <laughs> the, the, he's, he's 13, but uh, but I didn't take advantage of the power of compounding interest fast enough. I did maybe more than others, but nowhere near enough. I should have done that way from the beginning. How do you, how do you think that you know, we talked a lot about mindset at the beginning? How do you maintain your own mindset at this point when you run your own coaching business? Some days is hard, you know, like there's, there's bad days, but then I have so many good days that I don't even remember the bad days. So it's now, now for me, it's a lot easier because my natural way of being is to be positive charge forward. So if you tell me no, that's fine. That's just one answer. We'll, we may come up with other answers, <laughs> but I'll find a way through it, around it, over it, or we're going to redefine the playing field. Be and, and the reason for that is, and I'm going to go a little bigger on this, is people fought wars. People we know went to war for my right to be able to call who I want, talk to who I want, knock on a door, make a phone call, do a deal. And other people suffered so that I had the right to do that. So am I going to waste that? My parents came over from Italy with nothing. And when I say nothing, I don't mean nothing. Like nothing. They didn't have anything. My dad got spit on when he went to apply for jobs. How can I come here now and not make the most of everything he suffered to do that, right? And I, yeah. my, my story is not unique. We all came from somewhere. But what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to go, eh, you know, gave it my best try. And I just smoke weed all day and sit on the couch. Yeah, go smoke as much weed as you want. Sit on the couch. You're out of my, you're off my radar. You're no longer a competitor to me. 
The only people I compete with are people that I view as ahead of where I want to be, whether that's in fitness, in family, in faith, in business. That's, you know, so I make that my marker. I, I like I, I like how you put that. And, and you know, all these basic things, there's a lot of people out there through the pandemics really struggling with mental health, the, the, the physiological <laughs> stuff of get, get enough sleep, eat right, and exercise. Very important, right? It's going to help you stay above board, above the... Yeah. Uh, uh, the line, as you put it, but it, it, it's, it's just a, um, personally, it's refreshing for, for me to talk to people like yourself who have meandered their way through really interesting entrepreneurial have careers, yeah, yeah. Have. <laughs> have been through several different, uh, business experiences in different industries and now have really backed into something that they're passionate and fired up about and is aligned with their, uh, personal life and, and their personal values. It's just really refreshing to, to see that because there are a lot of people out there throughout the, the country and the world that don't have that opportunity or um, just haven't found that success quite yet. You know, make it, go, go, do, go do a side gig of some sort. Like if you have a job that you can't leave because you've got a family, you got a mortgage, all those things are real, but go do something that makes you happy. And your side gig might be marathons. It might be riding a bike, it might be mountain, I don't care, whatever it is, but go do that thing. It might just be be the greatest dad or mom you can be. Take your kid fishing. Like, okay, that's what you got to do. But do whatever you can do to be in control of that piece of your destiny. That is very well put, Dominic. What um, what what did we miss? You you said you have two podcasts and uh, focus on uh, the construction industry, if I recall, right. right? So yeah. tell us about your your podcasts and your coaching and all of that. So, you know, as you mentioned, meandered that I take that as a compliment. I get that all the time. They're like, <laughs> I meant okay. it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, okay, so you're an archaeologist who started a pharmacy as an online business. And then you grew a global franchising company. And now you run a podcast for construction. They're like, those lines don't mash, m match up, but they do to me. They do to me. So when I became a business coach, I, you know, one of the things you have to do in any business is find people who are more like you. And so talking to construction business owners is just like hanging out with my family. That's my dinner table was construction business owners. That's my uncles and some of my aunts. Like, it's just how we talk. And so that was my natural place to start working with business owners. I had a construction business, but I had a painting company. So a little different than somebody who's doing heavy construction. But that's over 21, 22 years ago now that I've been doing that. So I started two different podcasts because they have a slightly different voice. They have a different need. The first show that I started is called Cabinet Maker Profit System. So I work with cabinet makers, architectural mill workers, and furniture makers on how to turn their manufacturing businesses into a, a more profitable operating business. Fantastic audience, great people, and almost all of them are single generation multimillionaires. Hmm. Interesting. And I, sh I should add, same truck, same dog in the seat next to them. They went from one kitchen to doing a couple million a year. I'm not kidding. It is the most overlooked, wonderful market of great people. Hmm. So that show is, is its own thing. And then I have Profit Tool Belt. And the reason I started Profit Tool Belt is because other people were listening to the show asking me questions that I couldn't answer on there. And those other people were general contractors, other subcontracting trades, et cetera, you know, like electricians, plumbers, HVAC, roofers. And so I started that show. And again, the same story, roofers. They'll go from zero to millions of dollars in revenue, same truck, same guy, same dog in the seat next to him, now doing two, three, five, seven million dollars a year. And he, they come and talk to me because they're like, Dom, I don't know how I got here, but I feel stuck and I think we could do more. And so th those are the people who listen to my show. Very interesting. Well, it sounds like you found a rewarding little uh, section of, of the world to, yeah. to, 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 to swath of people to, to talk with every day. That, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show, Dominic. It, it, you have a very cool background and cool story, and I appreciate uh, you sharing some of your wisdom on mindset and strategic planning and why it's so important. And if we take anything away from today, I, I, I would say that you know anything is possible five, 10 years out. And um, if, if you think you, I mean, it's, it's going to sound cheerleadery and rah, rah, but if, if you think you can, you're, you're probably right. And doing the things day to day, that's going to propel you toward that intention, um, is just tremendously rewarding long-term. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is, this was great. I, I really enjoyed it. 
Thanks for tuning in to Grow Money Business, the podcast dedicated to helping business owners grow both their wealth and business on their own terms. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you digest podcasts to ensure you don't miss out on future episodes and announcements. And feel free to submit questions to growmoneybusiness.com.